like to call up to introduce our keynote speaker, Kevin Shannett from AFSC, um, Alberta's Agricultural Financial Services Corporation. I had the pleasure of meeting Kevin two weeks ago. We had a farm transition workshop in Red Deer, um, and it was nice to be able to meet him before today. So he is the VP of Lending at AFSC, and I'll invite him to the stage now to present Michael. And we really want to thank AFSC for sponsoring Michael to come to this conference. So if you could just put your hands together for Kevin. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to AgEx. As I was listening to the presentations this morning, there was the one analogy about communication, and they were talking about, you know, you do it four times, do it four more times, and then you'll get half as much. Well, that reminded me of a story. So I was the best man from uh, a good friend of mine, and he was getting married in the Cypress Hills in southern Saskatchewan. So they go to pick up their, their liquor order, and they're looking at it, and they're like, well, maybe take some of that away and double the rye order. So they look at it, and they're like, uh, no, double that again. Uh, so anyways, I got that all sorted. thought they were in good shape. We ran out before midnight. Uh, so any, anyways, a little bit of risk management there. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was a good time. It was a good night. Uh, just wanted to thank all of the presenters and the panelists from this morning. I hope everybody enjoyed the conversation and the dialogue as much as I did. I thought there was a lot of really good content that came out of that. And then also to Farm Management Canada and the team for the warm welcome and reception last night. Uh, as a 20-plus uh, year professional in the egg industry, and uh, most of that being in financial services, I can share with you that a lot of the information that we shared this morning I've seen firsthand. Uh, being in the financial services sector, you're able to connect with producers that are emerging, some that are struggling, and some that are thriving. And I would say that uh, unequivocally, those that are thriving are doing the things that they're talking about in the presentations here this morning. They know their numbers, they've got the financial reporting up to date, and they know where they're headed with their business. So if there's one thing you take away from today, I think it's to really, really focus on that and to implement that into your business. Uh, so uh, my name is Kevin Shawnett, Vice President of Lending at uh, Agricultural Financial Services Corp. It's a pleasure to be here with you today, and we're extremely proud to be sponsoring and introducing today's keynote speaker, Michael Langmeyer. Michael is the Director of Cropping Systems for the Center of Commercial Agriculture in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Purdue University. His extension and research interests include agricultural finance and cost of production. He participates in an international cost of production benchmarking network. We've heard about some benchmarking today, so really important information and data for our industry. And that benchmarking compares corn, soybean, and wheat break-even prices across countries. Michael has written numerous articles pertaining to financial analysis, crop budgets, leasing principles, cash rents, land values, farm growth, technology adoption, and transition planning. Pretty core to all the topics that we've been talking about here today. In addition to his extension research, he has taught courses in agricultural finance, economic theory, farm management, risk management, and tax planning. Today, Michael will draw on both his personal and his professional experience to discuss 10 questions that need to be addressed when, ex when examining challenges and opportunities associated with farm growth. We know that the motivations for farm growth are truly personal and unique to every farm operation and agribusiness. We heard that from our panelists this morning. Sometimes it's about growth, sometimes it's about maintaining profitability. It really varies depending on the individuals involved. So whether it's keeping up with the industry, responding to a change in the market, or bringing new family members into the fold, growth may mean changing how you do business, investing in new technology, adding employees, delegating responsibility, and often accessing more capital. At AFSC, our lending team solely focused on supporting primary agricultural producers and agribusinesses in Alberta through both our lending and business risk management programs. Through partnerships with producers and businesses, our aim is to help maintain a thriving and profitable agricultural sector in Alberta. By offering our suite of agribusiness, next generation, developing producer, and revolving loans, we're able to provide financing to start, develop, and grow your business. Our talented staff are focused on helping you access exactly what you need to do your business your way. So when you wake up in the morning and you see those eight down trees that Stu, uh, that Stu talked about this morning, you can have peace of mind knowing that your business is in good hands and you've done your planning. 
So with that, like you, I'm ready to take a deep dive into the topic of farm growth. So please join me in welcoming Michael Langmeyer. Thanks, Kevin. As Kevin indicated, I, I do cover quite a few topics. Um, I, I got a PhD in 1990 at Kansas State, or at, P, at Purdue University, rather, and then I uh, spent 22 years at Kansas State from 1990 to 2012. And then I had an opportunity to come back to Purdue and work for the Center for Commercial Agriculture. And so I've been back at, at Purdue uh, since 2012. Uh, as just like farms, we've had a lot of retirements in the farm management area in the last several years. And so, uh, therefore, I've, I've covered quite a few topics. Uh, I, I like to do that. I like new challenges. And so a new topic comes up, I usually jump on board. I like working with production scientists, and, but also uh, colleagues in Ag Econ. Um, this presentation is not about production costs, not about agricultural finance, but it was too tempting to put some of that stuff in here. Uh, and so I'm, I want to go ahead and, and talk a little bit about those topics uh, in, in the context of farm growth. Uh, and the reason I do that is really, before you even consider uh, farm growth, you need to know where you're at. Uh, what is your profit margin? What is your asset turnover ratio? What is your return on equity? What is your debt to asset ratio? How much liquidity do we have? Those questions have to be answered uh, before you grow because you're not going to grow out of a bad financial situation, right? Usually growth comes from strength. We have a solid liquidity, solid, uh, solid uh, leverage position, uh, had strong cash flow, strong profitability. Therefore, we have the funds uh, to grow. And so all of that uh, of agriculture finance, and I know Farm Management Canada over the years has done an excellent job uh, in the financial management area, uh, financial literacy. All of that has to be in place before you can even think about uh, farm growth. Another topic I cover um, in Indiana and, and surrounding states is, is, is um, out, uh, Outlook. Uh, and I wanted to mention that because uh, feel free to fire any questions uh, towards me. That doesn't guarantee I can answer them. But uh, um, I try to stump the professor. In my case, it's usually not that difficult. Uh, but please do come up with some questions, and they can be very broad. They don't have to necessarily be uh, related to, to farm growth. Um, one of the things that, that uh, I think Kevin might have mentioned briefly is um, my family's in farming. My brother farms uh, uh, by Omaha, Nebraska, about 60 miles from Omaha, Nebraska. And my sister married a farmer that's about 120 miles uh, northwest of Omaha, Nebraska. So my family is in farming. Uh, I chose the, uh, the geek route. And so I went on uh, and, and finished, uh, finished a PhD and have been in academia uh, per, uh, my whole career. Um, I'm really excited. My, my nephew's coming back. Uh, when my nephew comes back uh, next spring, he's getting a degree down at Auburn University in agronomy. When my nephew comes back next spring, he'll be the sixth generation uh, on that farm. So I'm very, very excited about that. So let's get into this. Uh, some questions to kind, of, uh, to kind of think about before we get into the discussion here is, how does our cost of production compare with farms producing similar products? I've spent most of my career doing research and benchmarking, and it's just truly amazing how much difference there is in financial performance from one farm to the next. Uh, for example, I've done some studies looking at 10-year averages and 20-year averages, for example. I'll, I'll, pick, I'll cherry pick some numbers for using the 20-year averages. If you look at the top quartile and the bottom quartile using 20-year averages, uh, you, the bottom quartile has a profit margin of 0%. Uh, and I, I think I'm defining the profit margin uh, fairly standard, but net farm income plus interest minus unpaid labor divided by gross income or value of farm production. So that bottom quartile, 0%. And you say, how can they do that? Well, they're covering unpaid labor. They just never have enough money to replace machinery. So what's happening on those farms? Machinery is getting older and older and older. And nobody's coming back to those farms, right? Very difficult to come back to farms like that. On the other hand, the top quartile is 20 per, above 20%. So 20% difference, and these are 10-year, 20-year averages of profit margin between the bottom quartile and the top quartile. So I can't emphasize enough uh, the importance of knowing your cost of production before we even think about uh, growing. Are we in that top quartile? Are we in that, uh, in that group? Uh, that's going to have the cash flow uh, to make this growth work. Um, does our farm have sufficient cash flow to, su to support full-time employment for each operator? In the United States, 90% of all farms are part-time. 
I don't know, does that surprise anybody? Um, but 90% are part-time. That means only 10% are full-time. And so a lot of part-time farmers would like to be full-time farmers, but they never really have enough cash flow in order to become a full-time farm. Also, there's a lot of people that like to, would like to join farms. Um, uh, do we, are we in a situation where we can actually accommodate additional operator? And I give a lot of transition planning talks, and they're much smaller crowds than this. Usually have 10, 15 people there. And one of the things I talk about, is, I'm not asking, is there enough work? That's not the question, right? The, the, the question is, is there enough cash flow and enough equity there to make this work? We all know there's enough work. As you get older, you can't work as hard. I can't outwork uh, some of the new hires we have at Purdue. Uh, and I hope my experience offsets some of that, but uh, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. You'll have to ask my uh, bosses uh, at, at Purdue. Uh, but, but that's the key question there. Uh, it, it, we don't have to worry about enough work. We know there's probably enough work. Um, is the farm large enough to accommodate somebody? And then another question that's very, very important when somebody's coming back to the farm, obviously, what skills do these people need? We all, like to ha we all like to work with people, so, or a lot of us like to work with people that are carbon copies. We don't get into personality conflicts that are carbon copies, typically. But that's not what the farm needs. If we haven't done a very good job on the financial end, maybe that person needs financial management skills. Really, really common in the United States for that person to need uh, knowledge about technology. Maybe that's the skills we need. Someone that's going to be able to look at this new technology and decide whether our farm should invest in that new technology. And so that's a, also a very, very important question to think about uh, when we're thinking about growth. Uh, I like to use this, uh, this matrix here. Um, and this, this is combining competitive position with market growth potential. And uh, if you're in the top quartile, you're going to have a strong competitive position from a profit margin return on equity standpoint. Excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with a bad cold. And so in that case, uh, we're either in this look for other ways to deploy capital. If we're in a mature or declining industry, if we're in a strong industry, ag aggressive growth. <coughs> I'm going to drink some water here. I've got some. And you might say, well, we're in a mature, declining industry. I'm not convinced. We've got a, a large growth in population coming down the pike around the world. We're going to need to increase production. Um, we've also got uh, countries like China and India where per capita incomes are increasing dramatically. They have already in the last 20 years. That's going to continue. And so the demand for agricultural products is going to be very, very strong. And so long term, I'm very bullish on production of agriculture for that reason. Uh, and so I think actually... If you're in a strong competitive position, you're probably in that growth box where you're looking at ways uh, to, to expand. Before I get to the, uh, the, the farm growth questions, I will get there, so bear with me. I want to talk a little bit about the business environment from a U.S. perspective. I don't expect it to be that different uh, than Canada or South America or, or Europe, but nevertheless, it is a U.S. perspective. To do that, I'm going to use some information from our Ag Economy Barometer. One of the things our center does every single month is we, we uh, summarize data uh, from a survey of 400 U.S. producers uh, ac across the country. These are crop producers and livestock producers of the major commodities in the United States. All of these producers are full-time operators, so they're part of that 10%, not part of that 90%. We started this back in late 2015 well, from a U.S. perspective, um, if you go back to 2007, 2007 to 2013 were really good. That's probably the best time in U.S. agriculture since 1910, 1914. And for your younger people over here, no, I was not around on 1910, 1914, but that was the best, best period in agriculture for a long time, that 2007, 2013. And that 2007 is... That, that was the ethanol boom. That was the start of the ethanol boom in the United States. We went from 0% of the corn used for ethanol to 35 to 40% today. 
Uh, and that's and we're by far and away the largest producer of corn. A third of all corn in the world is produced by the United States. That's a lot of corn, okay? And so, and so, and so 2007, 2013 were really good. 2014 to 2019 were not that good uh, in U.S. agriculture. And then 20, 2020, 2021, and 2022 uh, have been better than 2014 uh, to 2019. And the reason I say all of that is you go back uh, in time to 17, 18, 19, uh, the index is higher. The sediment's more positive during that period than it is right now. Uh, and 22 net farm income is substantially higher than what it was back in 17, 18, and 19. What is going on here? It's uncertainty. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But if you go back to 17, 18, and 19, yes, we had uh, trade issues in the United States with China. Um, but one and we had price volatility like we always have. Prices seem to always uh, be fluctuating, so we have that risk associated with fluctuating crop prices. But what didn't we have? The high input costs and the fluctuations in input costs. And so the sediment in the United States right now is substantially lower than, than it was a year ago, but even back in that period where net farm income wasn't near as high because of all the uncertainty related to crop prices and input costs. You look at inflation in terms of uh, input costs in the United States, for example, we had an inflation of 8%. If you go from, uh, you know, looking at the last 12 months, an inflation of 8% in the, in the United States. You think the producer costs went up more than 8%? How many think they went up more than 8%? You are 100% correct. They were double. They were double the 8%. And so agriculture was dealing with some very, very large uh, input, input cost increases. In fact, if you look at corn, I'll give a lot of references to corn because that's our biggest crop. 25% increase in break-even price from 21 to 22. If that doesn't cause someone to uh, sit up and take notice, I don't know what would. And another 10% I'm projecting from 22 to 23. And so very, very large, large increases in break-even prices. Someone said it earlier during the panel, that uh, prices tend to come down faster than input costs. They do. And so what's likely to happen uh, in the next few years, um, go, go out a year, two years, is, cr is crop prices are going are to uh, adjust. Uh, it's a world market. Uh, if, if, if we have more supply from South America, for example, uh, and, and, the, and, the and, the, and the stocks are not quite as tight, prices will come down. Input costs will come down slower. It'll take more time uh, for the input costs to come down. And so that's what's on uh, producers' mind right now. And so I wanted to keep this in mind when I talk about farm growth. Uh, looking at our sub-indices, uh, we have an index of current condition, the index of future expectations. If you go through that uh, 16, 17, 18, 19, where returns are a little bit uh, uh, tight, net farm income was relatively low during that period, the index of future expectations was above the index of current conditions. Most farmers are very optimistic or they wouldn't be in the business. Most small business owners are, are optimistic or they wouldn't be in uh, the business that they're in. And so that's no surprise. As we move into 2020, return prospects increased dramatically. The index of current conditions jumped above the index of future expectations. Now they've been just going sideways. And so this concern related to margins, uh, sque uh, you know, uh, squeezing margins, uh, is, is, uh, uh, is an impacting index of future expectations as well as the index of current conditions. Um, another thing we do is we ask a question every month. In fact, this is actually one of the questions that goes into the Ag Economy Barometer. Do you think now is a good, good, good or bad time to buy machinery and buildings? Now, you learn a lot when you do a survey like this. When we first started asking this, I thought, well, if cash flow's good, it'll be a good time. Wrong. Uh, I don't know how many times I've been wrong, uh, you know, looking at anticipations of, of, of answers to survey questions. That's not how they look at it. Uh, and, and, uh, and so one of the reasons why they think now's not a good time is what's happened to machinery prices. They're absolutely through the roof. Uh, both new and used machinery is very expensive, and so that's why they're relatively pessimistic about farm capital investments. 
Uh, an index below 100 would be neutral. Something over 100 would mean uh, we actually think this is a good time. Something under 100 means bad time. So obviously, I think this is not a good time uh, to buy machinery. And I would concur with them. Unless you really need it, uh, it's a very expensive time uh, to buy machinery. We have a follow-up question just confirming that here. We've been asking this for a while. Uh, rising interest rates and, and increased prices for farm machinery and new construction, that's 60%. Uh, and so 60% of the reason why it's a bad time uh, is related to input prices and, uh, and interest rates. Um, this is a question that also came up during the, the earlier discussion this morning. Uh, is what keeps you up at night? We've been asking this question for a while, and I'm really glad we added this because this really gives in, insight into the relative optimism and pessimism. And one of the things that's truly amazing about where we sit right now uh, is thinking about how people would have answered this prior to COVID. Uh, at least in the United States, if we, did, we didn't ask this in 2019, but if we would have asked this in 2019, their biggest concern would have been lower crop or livestock prices. I can almost guarantee that would have been the biggest concern. Maybe some concerns related to policy. Policy is always evolving in the United States and elsewhere. and has a big impact on agriculture and other industries. Uh, but today, almost 80% of the responses are related to input issues. Either high input costs, uh, high interest rates, or availability of inputs. Availability of inputs was a huge issue in this last year. Uh, you could get herbicide, you could get fungicide, but it might not, might not be plan A. You probably had to go to plan B, plan C. Uh, some, some herbicides that you didn't typically use before, they probably were much more expensive. Um, and so uh, that's, that's really what's on their mind. Uh, just a couple more questions here related to the business environment, uh, and then I'll move on uh, into more of the farm growth uh, finance area. Uh, we also uh, look at farm financial performance index. And so we ask people, uh, what's your financial performance this year uh, compared to last year? And so something under 100 means that, they're, that, that they're, the farm financial performance is lower today than it was a year ago. Well, it's no surprise that this is under 100 because 2021 was the best year for crop producers since 1973. So let me repeat that. 2021 was the best year for U.S. crop producers in general. There were some producers didn't have a good year. Um, can't predict yields, obviously. Uh, but it was the best year uh, for, for crop producers in the U.S. since 1973, which was the start of the export markets, uh, when the export markets, markets started opening up. And so 21 was a really good year. 22 is shaping up to be a decent year, but their concerns are more down the road. Uh, I think 23 and 24 looks like it's going to be very tight. Mar margins are going to be very tight. Um, but this is, what, this is what they're viewing, 22 compared to 21. And then I, I can't give one of these presentations anywhere without saying something about land values. Uh, and so we have a couple questions related to land values in this uh, survey. Uh, this first one here is expectations for the next 12 months. So where are land values heading in the next 12 months? There's less optimism than there was uh, 6 to 12 months ago in terms of increases in farmland prices. And we don't ask them how much. We just ask higher, lower, remain the same. Uh, but it's still overwhelmingly uh, think that, that farmland prices are going to continue to increase. Are they? I'm not too sure. Uh, uh, one of the things that's really helping in the United States right now is inflation. Um, I've done some research on that with some graduate students. Uh, farmland's a better hedge against inflation than gold, gold and silver. And so the outside investors see that. Uh, and so that's going to help the farmland market uh, in the short term. Um, but there is 12% think they're going to decline. Um, and the only time that really hit uh, a pretty high number was back when COVID started uh, in April of 2020. Um, when I was talking to producers in April of 2020 and May 2020, it's almost like the world ended. They were so pessimistic. Uh, and then we, the optimism increased dramatically. Uh, large increases in land values and uh, uh, land values haven't looked back since. But I can talk more about land values specifically 
uh, in, in, in questions and answers if you want me to. I'm um, looking at long term, looking at uh, farmland prices in the next five years. Uh, still a lot of optimism here, but this is one of what you call one of those no no brainer projections is what I would call this. Uh, if you look at Indiana, for example, and you look at moving five year periods and land values, I'll go back to 1960. I could go back further probably. There's only been like two or three periods where land values haven't increased in five years. Now I'm not, not adjusting for inflation here. This is nominal, but you know, you know, obviously that makes a difference. There's only been two or three times where they haven't increased. In the mid-1980s, the farm financial crisis in the United States, there was a couple, couple times. And then recently, 14 to 19, uh, we saw some declines in land values uh, in the Corn Belt. But other than that, uh, land values usually increase. In fact, the average increase in land values in Indiana from 1960 on is 5.5%, 6%. The only reason I bring that up is one of the things that's very critical to having a good uh, financial situation, at least from a U.S. perspective, is you have to own at least some land. Because a big chunk of your return long term comes from owning land, not necessarily uh, the, the operating return on investment. In fact, uh, USDA ERS uh, keeps, it, keeps a series related to this, and they look at return on investment. They split it into operating returns. That's the current. And they split it into land. Over time, it's about half and half. About half the return on investment uh, in agriculture is coming from owning land. That's one of the reasons why people bid so crazy when the cash flow is strong and the interest rates are low. They know this. They know this, that over time, one of the key, uh, key, uh, key, th key, key, uh, key facts are, are uh, related to having a strong balance sheet is owning at least some land. Now a question a little bit more direct to where we're heading next. This is a, we've been doing this for the last February, for the last six years or so. We'll do it again in 23. I don't think the results are going to be that different than what we're seeing now. But this always surprises me a little bit. Again, we're dealing with, a, with, with the top 10% of producers. That, that's who gets surveyed. It's a phone survey. That's who gets contacted in the top 10%. So they're all full-time farms. Um, and some of these are sole proprietors. In fact, a lot of them are sole proprietors. Partnerships, uh, LLCs, S-Corps, C-Corps, all those different entities are there. But what's truly amazing to me about this is 53% have either no plans to grow or plans to exit or retire the industry. What does that mean for the rest? There's opportunities. There's opportunities out there. Uh, and so if, if uh, uh, you know, if some of the farms that already have several family members uh, in the business, they're encouraging their younger family members, thinking there might be opportunities uh, to buy some ground in their area to rent additional land as people retire to come back to the farm. Now, again, uh, we ask that question, what skills do they need to come back to the farm? And another question uh, we, I sometimes ask, uh, I ask or, or, or talk to farms about, who should be allowed to come back? That sounds brutal, doesn't it? We can't, some, these farms can't take everybody. And so, and so that discussion has to be made. What, what, what skills do they need? How do they fit into our farm? Uh, and then we'll consider taking you, taking you, taking you in. We don't just take everybody uh, that, ne that isn't necessarily uh, interested in, in getting some skills that we need. Uh, and just because we're a family member, you know, here I am, I'm ready to, I'm ready to, ready to, to join the farm. Not necessarily. That, that's probably a naive view uh, that everybody's going to be able to, to enter the farm. Because these, as you know, these, uh, these number of fam, uh, farm families involved in these operations really expands over time. Um, you know, I, I know one family, for example, in Indiana, uh, if you go back two generations, it was one. It was a sole proprietor. Uh, uh, the husband and wife had 10 kids, okay? They had 10 kids. Four of them came back to the farm. So there's four brothers farming. They're now the older generation, of course, but four brothers farming. Think about how many kids they have. They all can't come back, uh, at least not right now, without some kind of strategic plan on how they're going to grow the business. They have both livestock and crop, and so they have some choices there in how they grow the business, but they're going to have to discuss that. 
They're going to have to discuss that with the younger generation and say, here, you know, here's the conditions under you being able to, to join this operation. Here's what we're going to have to do uh, if you do join this operation. So, uh, so 53% uh, are planning not to come back to the farm. And then look at how much difference there is in growth rates. And, and 10%, maybe just sitting here today, 10% doesn't sound like a high growth rate. That's really high. If you do the rule of 70, that's doubling every seven years. That's getting her done, uh, and, and uh, you know, in terms of a growth standpoint. And so uh, some very aggressive plans, uh, some no plan, no plans to grow at all. And I'm sure this is similar in other parts of the world. Um, final question here related to the ag economy barometer. We asked this very general question. Um, is this a good time uh, for someone to come back to the farm? It's usually 55, 60%. I've just got a couple years uh, reported here. Uh, we asked that again this month. The results will be uh, available in December, uh, and I would be surprised if it wasn't 55 to 60 percent. Uh, sometimes family will ask me, um, "Is this a good time to come back?" Well, depends. What you know? Wh where is the younger person at in their career? Uh, you know, what's their situation? So it, it depends. Uh, I know people get nervous with ag economists as we like to talk with both hands and maybe a couple feet and, uh, and do all these what ifs and so, and, and so on. But it really does depend. It really depends on where that young person is at, what skills they have, uh, you know, just as much as anything else. And just because it's a high price environment does not necessarily mean it's a good time, does not necessarily mean it's a bad time. Now, if they want to buy land, forget it. That's not happening, at least for a while. Uh, but, but certainly, even renting ground is difficult right now. But, uh, uh, but there's never a, a, a great time to come back, a perfect time to come back. Um, now I'd like to talk a little bit about some drivers, um, key drivers influence and consolidation. Then we'll get into my 10 farm growth questions. So we kind of talked about the environment, uh, where things are at in the United States, coming off some really good years, probably uh, going into uh, some years, two, three years in a row here, where it's not going to be as good. Um, and so, but we have, but the key thing there is we have cash flow. That's why land values went up 25, 30% in Iowa uh, in, in, in 21 and in early 22. Uh, they went up that much because the fundamentals were there. The demand from non-farm investments were there. Interest rates were still low at that time in the United States. Interest rates have increased 4% from the beginning of this year uh, to today. And they're probably going up another 2% here uh, in the next few months. Uh, and so, and so uh, all, all of that is very important uh, to think about. Before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about economies of scale. We hear a lot about that. Uh, you know, how, how big are the economies of scale in agriculture? And so this is a joint work with Mike Bolge. Mike Bolge uh, spoke to Farm Management Canada. I don't know how many years ago it was, but I know he's, you know he's been up here. Because when he saw my picture uh, on your website, he said, hey, I did that one time. And, I said, well, I'm going to present some of the stuff that we worked on together. And this is one of the pieces that we worked on together for the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. And so I'm going to summarize a relatively long article. You could say long-winded, but a relatively long article. Not long-winded, good article. Uh, and and, and in, in just a few slides. And so what we did here is we looked at all these different factors related to consolidation of production agriculture and try to create a table uh, saying... Uh, you know, showing all of these factors that could be uh, considerations and saying how important are those of an advantage to large farms. So this is our attempt to really try to, really try to, uh, to, to look at the factors related to economies of scale. It's more than just uh, cost per unit. There's a lot more to it than just being a low cost producer and we're going to go through that. Uh, and, our, and our point was here is we're thinking about consolidating. Again, before we get into the 10 growth questions, we really need to look at this. Uh, uh, you know, what's going to be the result uh, of this farm growth? We don't want to just grow for the sake of growing. Again, going back to that question, uh, what, what, how do we define success? Farm growth could be part of that because it could be bringing more family members into the operation. That could be uh, one of the goals of the business. Uh, and so these are some of the key things to look at uh, when we're thinking about expanding. Uh, and obviously, uh, one of the things that's really changing today uh, compared uh, when, I started, when I started the profession 32 years ago, it seems like yesterday, uh, but 32 years ago when I started the profession, one of the things that's really changed, if you go back 32 years, what was the main competitive advantage? At least it was in the U.S. Low cost. 
low cost, low cost, low cost. Today, it really is broader than that. Uh, and I say largely because of pre precision agriculture is leading us into a little different direction. And again, this is for guys asking questions. You can ask questions about this, how this precision agriculture might be leading us in a different direction. Be glad to answer those. Uh, but I think, uh, uh, I think there is going to be some opportunities or more opportunities out there to be more value added. And this could be a quarter per bushel. I call, I'm very, very broad minded when you look at value added. I call growing waxy corn, which is not that different from co commodity corn, uh, but growing waxy corn uh, that's used to make uh, corn flour and starch, corn starch, they get a quarter more per bushel for going waxy corn. So to me, that's value added. So I'm thinking very narrowly uh, in value added. But those opportunities are bigger today than they ever have been. And because precision agriculture allows us to have traceability, uh, uh, look at food safety uh, much closer than we have before, I think these opportunities are going to take off. Uh, and so just being a low-cost producer is not going to be the be-all and end-all uh, in, in the rest of my career. And so uh, let's get into the key drivers. I think government payments and limits are actually a negative. Uh, they're actually advantageous towards small farms. Um, we, have, we have payment limits. Now, there's ways around those payment limits, but it takes some effort uh, to get around those payment limits. And so that's not an advantage to the large farms. Uh, even the crop insurance. Everybody gets a similar subsidy for crop insurance in the United States, and it is about 55% on average. About 55% of our crop insurance is subs uh, of the cost of crop insurance is subsidized in the United States. It varies by product, um, but uh, but I think overall, government payments and limits are more advantageous to the smaller farm. In fact, that's one of the reasons why they think we have government payments is that farm safety net. Uh, and, and so that's, that's definitely the case. Off-farm employment opportunities, what I mean by that is the farm, farm, the, the farm owner, sole proprietor, or some of the family members work off the farm. That really is not an advantage to the small, medium, or large farm. Now, it's very geographic. Uh, in Indiana, where I'm at, there's all kinds of, of off-farm job opportunities. It's really easy to be a part-time farmer in, in the eastern Corn Belt because there's a lot of people. Seven million people in Indiana. That's a lot of people. I'm coming from Nebraska, okay? Nebraska doesn't have very many people. It's a million and a half people. Half of them live in Omaha and Lincoln. So there isn't many off-farm employment opportunities in the Western Corn Belt. Uh, all that time I spent in Kansas, you wouldn't believe how tough some of those towns look. There's not much off-farm employment opportunities. Geographically, huge differences, but farm size, not so much. Uh, capital and labor markets, I think once a person is hired, has hired their first uh, hired employee, non-family member, it's easier to hire the second, third, and fourth. And so I think that's an advantage uh, to, the, to the larger farms. Also, capital markets, again, once you've borrowed money, uh, at the scale we're talking about today, it's, it's a little easier uh, to pay me, ask for a little bit more. Uh, and so that's, that's also a little bit advantageous towards larger farms. Managerial resources, what I'm talking about there is as a farm gets bigger, the managers can specialize more. And so you can say, oh, he's the personnel manager. He's in charge of accounting and financing. He's in charge of personnel and, and so on. Well, that's an advantage uh, to be able to do that. Uh, risk, I think uh, the risk tools are available to everybody. But again, it goes to that managerial resources. Is there a person on the farm that really can take the time uh, to, take, to, to spend more time on the marketing strategy rather than just having a, mar a marketing strategy like a lot of farmers in the U.S. have where you just sell so much of the commodity over time. It's not a terrible strategy uh, in, in most years, but some years it leaves a little bit to be desired. Uh, but, uh, and so I think risk, uh, risk strategy is definitely, there's an ad bad, advantage, uh, you know, advantage to the larger farms. And then let me get to this profitability and growth focus. What I mean by that is remember I said, being the top quartile, uh, you have to have 20% or above profit margin over a long period of time. That's the number for the U.S. And um, there's some small farms that have that. What's their problem? There's not enough cash flow left after they pay themselves. They, they're generating a lot of money, but the farm's not big enough to both pay themselves, uh, you know, a, a certain family living, and have enough left over to grow. 
And so uh, large farms also have that advantage. It's, uh, if it's a small farm with a 20% uh, profit margin, they might have nothing uh, that's left after they pay themselves and, and they pay the principal and the debt. A larger farm, five, six family members, maybe more, there's more cash flow there after they pay themselves. There's more money available uh, to retain in the business uh, and, and to grow the business. And so that's definitely an advantage. Um, cost economies, obviously, uh, in the U.S., and this has been, I've seen studies outside the U.S., it's an L-shaped cost curve. It's very, very steep over certain, um, certain size, certain acres, head of cattle, sw uh, swine, dairy. I've done this with a lot of different enterprises uh, when I spent all that time in Kansas where the livestock was very, very important uh, compared to Indiana. Uh, so definitely an L-shaped cost curve. Huge advantages uh, to becoming at least a certain size. And in the United States right now, this isn't the sweet spot because I think costs continue to decline. But there's some pretty big, uh, pretty big advantages to, being, to having at least a million dollar gross. That doesn't sound that big, but that, that, the, the person with a million dollar gross has a much better cost structure in general than a farm that has $200,000 gross. And so that's what I mean by the L-shaped cost curve. Once you get up to a certain size, it seems to level out a little bit. Uh, technology, the second machine age, the precision agriculture, autonomous tractors, autonomous, uh, autonomous grain carts, on and on down the line. I think the larger farms, because of this cash flow situation, they're going to be able to adopt those technologies quicker because they have the cash flow. Now, does that mean they should do it this year? Eh, it's expensive, uh, but I'm, I'm talking long term here. And then that, uh, what I alluded to earlier, this value chain alliance. Um, if you were somebody like Frito-Lay or an agribusiness, would you rather work with 50 larger farms or 1,500 small farms? Think about all the work there is with negotiation and all of that stuff. They would rather work with a smaller number of large farms. That's just, just a fact. Uh, and, and again, I think this, could, this is potentially changing uh, competitive advantage uh, for some operations. This, and, and this precision agriculture is really, really causing a re reconfiguration of the value chain. So, I went through all of that so I get to my 10 growth questions. But I think it's very important to kind of see where we're at from a business environment, what is consolidate, what, what, what are some factors related to consolidation before we start looking at farm growth. And so given all that background, um, first question. And, and this also, these 10 questions were written up in different articles by Mike Bolgi and myself. And so this is a joint product, uh, product between uh, Bolgi and myself. One of the reasons I came back to Purdue is to work with Mike. Um, and so that, that's, it's worked really well for me. And so why grow? Uh, maybe we can reduce per unit costs. Uh, maybe. If we're not a low-cost producer now, Growing is not going to magically make us a, a low-cost producer. Uh, improve profit margins. Again, if we have 0% profit margin, doubling in size is probably not going to create a 20% profit margin. It's not. Um, improve asset utilization. That's a big one. Um, two of the big costs that really hit are, have very, very strong economies is labor. Labor is used much more efficiently on larger farms much, much more efficiently in larger farms. Um, part of that specialization, part of it's just capacity issues. Uh, you just do a better job of utilizing labor, but also assets. Uh, you buy these expensive tractors, and, and obviously if you have more units to, to use those tractors on, uh, that's going to improve asset utilization. So that's, that's also a key. But so all of those need to be thought about when you're thinking about growing. Certainly the big one that I talk to uh, producers about is bringing in a new family member. Uh, or investing my retained earnings. A lot of times farmers, they don't like to invest outside of agriculture. Nothing wrong with that. You're comfortable investing in agriculture and you got retained earnings, you grow. Uh, more fully utilized skills of key managers. That could also be a reason to grow. So a lot of reasons to grow. Have one or two. Again, we have to go back to this. I've probably talked about this enough. Where are we at from a uh, profitability standpoint? What does our liquidity and leverage look like? Uh, what's our competitive advantage? Our, our, do we really have a competitive advantage? How do you know whether you have a competitive advantage? Are you that 20% profit margin guy? Are you that 0% profit margin guy? The proof is in the pudding. Uh, I don't know if that's common saying up here in Canada. 
very common in the United States. Proof is in the pudding. Uh, and so do you have a competitive advantage? Um, do we have the resources to expand? And that includes human capital. Do we have the, 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 the resources, including management, managerial ability, to expand? Uh, and one of the exercises I sometimes do, particularly with young farmers, is I'll go around the room and have them identify what they do that's unique, particularly if they're going back to the farm, that gives them a competitive advantage. That's really a good way to think about uh, whether you have a competitive advantage. Because if you're not doing anything unique, you don't have a competitive advantage. Why would you get a 20% profit margin rather than 10%? That's the average. If you're just doing every same as everybody else, uh, you're going to have the same profit margin as everybody else. Uh, and so that's a useful exercise if you haven't went through that before. Think about what do we do better than our other operations? It, it allows us to have a, a good financial performance. And talk about competitive advantage, uh, the two main strategies is, is, is still being a low-cost producer, and that's still probably the overwhelming choice uh, by, by farms, uh, trying to be a low-cost producer, but also this uh, produce differentiated product, uh, have slightly higher revenue per unit. Now, it doesn't do you any good to produce a differentiated product if your costs are high. That's obviously obvious, but I, I need to say that. Uh, these people that grow waxy corn, seed soybeans, non-GMO crops, these are very common examples in Indiana. White corn, we have a lot of popcorn production. Their costs are competitive. Not, not necessarily with commercial corn when it comes to popcorn, because that's a different cost structure, but certainly non-GMO corn, waxy corn, white corn, they better have very similar cost of production to yellow corn, or they're not going to be profitable. Uh, that, that quarter or 50 cent uh, premium you get is just disappears into the ether. Uh, so I like to use this matrix also with audiences. And your goal should be either be in box two or box six. So box two is for the low cost producer. And box six is for the producer that's producing a value added crop. How do I know whether I'm in box two or box six? Am I that 20% profit margin guy or that 0% profit margin guy? Um, and then the 10% profit margin, that's the parity position there, kind of a status quo. Probably not going to generate enough, uh, enough cash flow, retained earnings to grow uh, very aggressively at all in box five. It really takes box two or box six to have sufficient funds uh, to be able to grow. And then unfortunately, uh, we also have people in boxes four, seven, and eight uh, with a 0% uh, profit margin. Um, and I don't want to pick on producers because uh, my family are producers and I wouldn't want to pick on my brother, poor guy. He's not here to defend himself. This is true in every industry. Every industry has this, this, this huge difference of performance between top quartile and bottom quartile. Look how many restaurants go out of business. Uh, the, the, business that has, the business that has the lowest uh, turnover has the highest retention uh, is funeral directors, but I don't think everybody wants to be a funeral director to try to take advantage of that. So most industries have turnover, uh, so that's not that unexpected. Um, second question, what are my options to grow? Um, typically, we just expand, but there is other options. So we could intensify or modernize. That's more for a livestock producer. Um, you know, for example, one of the ways that Indiana producers are growing, if they're trying to bring someone back to the farm, is we have tremendous opportunities to, to add swine finishing barns and laying hen barns. Uh, they're not cheap in today's environment to put up one of those buildings, but it is an opportunity for someone to, to increase their, their value of farm production without expanding acreage. Because there's parts in Indiana, just like Canada, where it's very difficult to, buy, to, to, to find ground to, to, uh, uh, to rent or to even buy. Uh, and so sometimes you have to do more, you have to do more than just expand acreage, uh, for example. Uh, integrate, certainly a possibility. Uh, you know, during COVID, we saw a lot more people that were uh, selling meat, freezer beef, for example. So that would be an example of that. Uh, does integration necessarily uh, improve resilience? No. I'm not convinced it does. I, I think uh, horizontal uh, integration where you're, you're maybe, uh, maybe adding that livestock barn or, uh, or you're adding acreage, 
that can, or maybe producing some different crops, I think that can improve resiliency, but I don't think integration does. So you really got to think about integration more from a profit standpoint, on uh, bringing in returns uh, from doing the integration. Obviously, one is delay farm growth, and over half the people chose that one. Third question. I want to make sure I have leave time for questions here. So what strategy, what strategic issues should influence my growth uh, choices? You've all done, or perhaps heard of, or done. I'm assuming a lot of people in the room have probably went through this exercise where you do strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, or, or, or a variation of that, uh, strategic planning. Uh, I know Farm Canada, Canada, again, has emphasized the strategic planning. Well, that's what I'm talking about here. What's, what's the internal analysis? Uh, what are our resources? What are our capabilities? What are, what are our core competencies? Uh, what, are the, what are the things that we do that are unique? Um, you know, maybe we're really good at marketing, for example. Or maybe we have someone on the farm that just that is really, really good with technology. I'm just giving you examples. Or maybe we have someone on the farm that's really good at finances. That always makes me smile. Uh, one of the things I get to, do, get to do at Purdue is every year we have a farm tour. Uh, we, still, we still do that. We've been doing it since the 1930s. As long as I'm there, we will be doing it. Uh, and so we have a farm tour, and we talk to two, three uh, successful farms, and we ask them all these questions. And I usually ask them this unique resource question, but one other question I have is I go around to all the, it's, it, it, these, are not, these are not sole proprietors, these are typically larger than that, and I ask every single person what their role on the business is. That's usually key to the unique resource. The, you know, you're looking for the skills that each, each of those individuals have Probably those skills are leading to the competitive advantage because you've got people who are doing things and doing things very, very well. Um, external analysis, looking at the market, uh, and so on. For a while there, uh, every, every, every presentation I gave in India, Indiana, I'd get, a, I'd get a question related to him. Should I grow him? My standard answer was no. Uh, and, and the reason I said that is there was not established markets for it at the time. And I know I'm more risk averse than most farmers. That's one of the reasons I'm not farming, is, is it doesn't fit my rest pref preferences. I like that nice steady income uh, that you get with, with academia. Uh, so I know I'm more, more risk averse, but if there's not established markets, you're, it's too easy to get left with an empty sack. Uh, and, and at least the people that were asking that question really didn't have the wherewithal to get into a new venture. Okay? It's not the people that have 10,000 acres uh, and probably could manage 100 acres of him. It was the people that really couldn't, they really couldn't afford uh, to get into a venture that, that would fail, and a lot of those did fail. So I'm right once in a while. Uh, how should growth ventures be evaluated? So a lot of different ways to do this. We could spend a whole class period on this. In fact, I do uh, in my agricultural finance. A couple of these topics get their own Class period, if you will. Expected returns and risk. You don't get something for nothing. And so if something has high return, i.e. him, potential for high return, guess what? It also has high risk. Uh, and so, and so uh, from expected return risk standpoint, I think strategic fit is very important. Does, do, 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 does what we're thinking about doing, and particularly if we're doing something different, does it fit in with our strengths? Do we have someone in the farm that's going to be able to manage this new venture and really keep their thumb on it? Uh, we can't do anything new by just devoting 5% of our time to it. We've got to be able to have a person that can really devote it uh, to making it work. Uh, and that's true even in my example like waxy corn. We've got to make sure there's someone on there that, that follows the rules uh, and, 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 and is going to make sure that we get that quarter per bushel premium. Funding, obviously. Uh, do we have, how, what's our liquidity and solvency? Entry and exit, how hard is it to get, to get in and out? That's why a lot of times uh, corn soybean growers, what do they do to expand? More corn and soybeans. <laughs> they know the entry, they know the exit, it's, it's, they, know the, they know that. It's fairly easy to get in, fairly easy to get out. Assuming you're not buying that $30,000 per acre land that was talked about earlier. Uh, and, 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 and so that's also very important there, manage your requirements. I've talked about that quite a bit. So fifth question, hopefully I'm giving you some food for thought here. The emphasis is important of strategic fit. And this is actually a direct quote from Bolgi. 
It takes more time to unwind a bad decision than it does to make sure it fits with your business in the first place. This is that exit strategy. Think about what I was saying earlier that some of these operations are buying these swine finishing barns. Hundreds of thousands of dollars for one barn. Very, very expensive. Do you think those have much resale value? No. And so it's very expensive to get into that and then have to get out. And so how much do you trust that person you're contracting with? And so when you talk about risk, it's not just marketing, financial, and production. It's relationship risk. Uh, that's the other big one that's really coming here. The other big risk that, that I like to talk about is what I call strategic, uh, strategic risk. That's, that's uh, doing our competitive positioning, strategic plan, uh, and doing it wrong. You know, not spending enough time thinking about that, uh, and, and therefore we go in a direction uh, that's very costly to unwind. Uh, and so that's why I, I really emphasize that strategic fit. Fifth question, skill assessment. I think this is a good idea, particularly if someone's come back to the farm. Um, we're, you know, I've got, we've got lists for every one of these. Uh, like I said earlier, I'm a bit of a geek, and so I've uh, put together a list for every single one of these on the Center for Commercial Agriculture website, where somebody could do a checklist from one to five uh, on these 10 different things related to financial management. Where do I stand? And now obviously, if you're very, very low, that person that's coming back to the farm better be good at that. Uh, that you know, it, it, some farms are hiring CFOs. I'm sure that's the case in Canada, too. But do you think a one-man shop is really hiring a CFO? No. Uh, and, and, so, and so if someone's coming back, uh, we go through this list here. Uh, where could they help us? Where could they help, uh, help us uh, with, our farm with our farm situation and so we can uh, expand in a very uh, beneficial way? Um, Self-appraisal. Uh, strong management or, or adequate capital. Uh, and, and a lot of the people that, that I work with, quite frankly, in today's environment are very good uh, situated financially. That's, again, why they're building, bidding up land. Uh, and have fairly strong management staffing. And so they're in that top box, top right box there, uh, uh, expansion, expansion and acquisitions. Sixth question. Uh, how do I finance growth of my operation? How much retained earnings do I have? Uh, you know, what's my leverage position? Do I have some capacity there to borrow money? Um, one of the disagreements between the young operation and the, and the older generation, particularly if let's say there's just two generations there, young generation, somebody's coming back to the farm, that's the people I see a lot, and then sometimes I get to meet their parents, but not always. Uh, one of the conflicts and goals uh, for the, from the, for those two generations, is debt. Uh, the younger person, they're all excited about all this stuff they learned at Purdue, and, and they got these ideas on how we're going to grow. And then they talk to dad, and dad said, you know how long it's taken me to reduce my debt? That was a goal. I don't think that's a good goal, by the way, to be debt-free. Uh, you know, if that business is continue, why does it have to be debt-free? Uh, but nevertheless, that's how some of the older generation are thinking about that. Is, is many times they might have lived through the mid-1980s where debt was a huge problem. They don't want to get into a situation uh, where, where, where they're going to uh, cause tremendous financial stress. And so that, that has to be worked out uh, between the generations if someone's coming back. And then, of course, uh, we need to think about the impact of increasing debt on risk. Uh, again, looking at research that, we, that I've done as well as uh, uh, research by other individuals in Ag Econ, uh, the biggest source of risk if you measure it with variability in returns, is debt to asset. Higher the debt to asset, the more risky the business is. And a lot of, in my experience, if the people that had the 70%, 80%, 90% debt to asset ratios, they didn't do that because they were aggressive in expansion. They got, they got there because their cash flow stunk and they couldn't pay the principal. Uh, and, and so when I say aggressive, uh, you know, a debt to asset, you're looking at someone that's fairly aggressive. This is coming from the U.S. perspective. You're talking someone in that 40% range uh, that may be thinking about borrowing some more money. They really need to think about the impact on risk. Yeah, that rule of thumb of over 50% is owned by somebody else, that scares a lot of people, and it probably should. And so think, certainly thinking about debt uh, uh, when you're talking about growth is extremely important. And many times we don't have enough retained earnings to grow very fast. And so we can use retained earnings, 
by all means, use retained earnings, but you're also going to take some uh, debt too. Um, what business model do I use? Well, if it's internal growth, retained earnings only, you're not going to grow at 10%. But maybe that's acceptable. Maybe that's acceptable to, do, to, have, to slower the growth rate, uh, but also reduce the risk. Uh, also, um, there's other, obviously, other uh, options here, uh, mergers and acquisitions. We, we have cases now where the whole farm, somebody, somebody retires, and rather than buying the land, they buy the whole farm, grain bins, machinery, uh, the whole nine yards. My brother actually did that uh, uh, a year or two ago, just bought the whole, whole you know, uh, just bought the whole farm. Uh, and, and, and there's other things here, too, uh, that we could, we could talk about. Eighth question. What is the impact of expansion on my financial performance two years from now, three years from now? And so if you do a business plan, don't rush through the financial portion of the business plan. Make sure that you do that, do, do, do that seriously. Uh, try to get some projected prices. Uh, use realistic yields. Come up with some realistic cost estimates with some inflation in there. And really go through that. What's the impact of my expansion on my financial performance? Uh, liquidity solvency, too. But what's the impact of expansion on my uh, liquidity performance? I like the three scenario. You get past three scenarios, and I get lost. And I'm an egghead. So I like worst case, most likely, and best case. You keep the best case in there. Because in the best case, you have more retained earnings and grow even more. Um, and then uh, impact on managerial attention. I've talked quite a bit about that. And I mean, we, when we start new ventures, um, this is challenging from a management time uh, and, and managerial requirements. So make sure we have someone in the forum uh, that, that's able to spend time on this new venture. We're thinking about a new venture. And landlord relationships. You know, I, you know, I said the main way that corn soybean growers expand is more corn soybean acres, but you need to spend time with that, those landlords. And so one of the best advice you can give to a younger, uh, with the younger generation is think of a landlord you could work with by yourself, with your dad as a backstop, or your grandfather's a backstop, or your uncle as a backstop, and kind of manage that. What better way to gain experience uh, is to be able to work with a landlord like that. Uh, startup challenges, we always have to remember these, particularly with livestock. Uh, when's the cash flow is going to start? Go back to that swine finishing barn. When you put up the building, do we get any cash flow? No. It takes time. And so all of that has to be, all of that has to be thought through. That's one of the reasons why a lot of restaurants fail. They're getting business, but they run out of liquidity. They can't make it long enough until they get their name out there uh, and they start making money. They just can't, can't make it there. Uh, and, and so that's obviously very important. Again, I've talked about management many, many times. And then finally, my 10th question, then we'll, uh, we'll think about some questions here for, uh, for me. Uh, what is my sustainable growth rate? Um, I don't emphasize this much because this is the growth rate that you could have just on retained earnings. Most people don't think of just retained earnings when they think about growth or thinking about uh, using debt too. But if you wanted to calculate that, uh, you could actually calculate that. And this is where the big difference is between the small farms with a 20% profit margin and the big farm with 20% mar a 20% profit margin. For the small farm, their sustainable growth rate is close to zero because all the money is going out for family living, uh, things like that, and there's just no money left. There's no cash flow left after you pay the principal. You might be able to replace the machinery, a machinery once in a while. It's probably second, third, uh, vintage, it's older machinery, nothing wrong with that, uh, but I'm just stating a fact uh, where the larger farms, uh, their sustainable growth rate would be, would be higher. Um, I really want you, we, we won't do this as an exercise here, but I really want you to think about this. Um, think about your financial situation and then really think about, if you haven't done this before, Really think about what are some growth opportunities for my farm in the next five years or ten years. And so I want you to really think about those. So with that, I think I can uh, take some questions. Yeah, sure. They should pop up on the screen. <coughs> Oops. A little bit of a problem there. Oh, good. We got one. There you go. You're off to the races, Michael. There was one there. Oh. He disappeared. <laughs> 
Somebody erase the ball. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, here's your opportunity to get out your phones and go to menti.com and you can type in the code at the top of the screen there. Or you can uh, scan the QR code. We'll leave it up for a couple seconds. And feel free to ask any questions you like to Michael. We've got about 10 minutes. Any questions? There we go. Why, why, do you, why do you think interest rates will rise by 200 base, basis points from now? Inflation is not under control. That is the key sentence to why I think they're going to continue to increase. The, the Federal Reserve in the United States is going to keep in, increasing interest rates until it looks like inflation starts to come down. Uh, and and uh, 200, that might, not be, that might not be the final word. Uh, I think where the operating interest rate in the, in the United States, it was 5%. It could approach 10%, maybe slightly more when this is all said and done. Now, I'm not so worried because the debt load right now in the, in, for most farms in the United States is not so bad that that's going to crunch their cost budget. Though it, though it, it's going to impact the cost budget. No DFNs or budget about it. I'm worried about land. One of the reasons why asset prices are so high, stock market, uh, farmland, real estate, is low interest rates. We are not in the same environment we were in since 2008, uh, the financial crisis of 2008, when the Fed took those uh, Fed funds rates to zero. That is not the environment we're living in. This is going to take a while for some people to catch on. This $30,000 land, is in, it, that's never going to cash flow. Uh, this is a big problem for them. Now, what they're like, likely, the, the way they likely justified that is they said, well, I got all this other land, so I'll just average it. Is that really a good strategy? Well, you could pay for it, but is that $30,000 land ever going to pay for itself? No. Uh, and, and so that's why I don't, I don't think it's over until inflation's, uh, uh, inflation is, is flattens. Uh, and I don't think I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we're, we're done done increasing interest rates. Uh, twenty twenty three being a repeat of two thousand nine two thousand thirteen, uh, lower prices, high inputs, negative margins. Uh, well, in the United States, it would probably be a, it would probably be a repeat of two thousand fourteen to two thousand nineteen, uh, in our context. And uh, I think we're in I think we're in a similar period. I don't call that a crash. But I think we're in a, in a period where we are going to we are going to see margins much much tighter, uh, and and uh, uh, we're going to see some opportunities for growth there. So it's not going to be a situation where financial stress is going to zoom up by any means. But it's certainly going to be different than 21 and 22, 20, 21 and 22. Uh, you know, we're going to come down to earth a little bit. Uh, it wasn't too difficult to get a 30 percent profit margin in 21 and 22. That's going to be really difficult uh, coming up. What do you think is a good debt-to-asset ratio? You need to discuss that on your farm. That is very farm-specific. What some people can live with, others cannot. My grandfather uh, was a tenant farmer his whole life. He hated debt. Uh, he bought his first home when he was 67 years old. He couldn't sleep for two nights, despite the fact that he paid cash. And, and so, so him... Zero. Uh, for, for, for a lot of farmers, uh, once, they get, once you get up to that 30% or more, they start feeling a little bit, uh, little bit worried. Our average is, is lower than that. Our average right now is about 25% uh, debt to asset ratio. But, uh, but another consideration when you think about debt to asset ratio is what do you think land values are going to do? Your debt to asset ratio might look really good now. What happens if land values decline 10%? They could. Uh, then what does your debt to asset ratio look like? Uh, what re recommendation would you give to a person that wants to become a first-generation producer? Boy, I don't run into this too often. Well, uh, you're going to have to be very careful on how you spend the capital you have. So you're probably not going to buy any land. That's pretty obvious. Try to figure out a way that you maybe could use some machinery. Uh, if you don't have any family members, that would be a good place to start, maybe using some of their machinery. Is there a way for you to share machinery with a neighbor? 
to try to reduce those machinery costs per acre. So anything you can do to try to reduce those asset, uh, those, those, those asset prices or asset, you know, asset costs uh, is, is, is the main thing you need to do. Uh, how does farm financial literacy affect the results of your research? Well, I've been preaching to people for 32 years that they need to uh, calculate the profit margin. I'm not sure I've been tremendously successful. Maybe Farm Management Canada is way ahead of me on this. I think more today are doing it than they were 30 years ago. But quite frankly, I'm very disappointed that there isn't more doing, uh, keeping track of, of their financial metrics. And, and I see farms that are relatively large and they don't have the slightest clue. They just know, well, I had good cash flow. Uh, that's not gonna cut it uh, in today's environment. Uh, you know, just gauging how much money you have this year. And so, and so we got a ways to go yet. Uh, job security uh, uh, for younger professors, perhaps. Has the relationship between rental rates versus land purchase costs changed? And what is the near-term outlook for rental rates? Oh, this is a great question. From 2007 to 20, 2021, land values went up much, much faster than rent. Why? Rent is primarily driven by net return to land. Obviously, we had some good returns, uh, 2007, 2013, for example, so rents went up. Land is driven by many other factors, the big one being low interest rates. Again, the, 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 we were in an environment that was so unique. I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, from, from that 2006, 2007, 2008 to about 2021, we were in a very, very low interest rate environment, lowest interest rates we'd seen in the United States since the 1950s. We're not going to be in that environment for a while again. They're not, Fed rate's not going back to zero anytime soon. I hope it doesn't. If the Fed rate goes back to zero, the U.S. economy tanked. That's the only scenario where we'd go back to a really low interest rate. So it's just a different environment. And so during, during that period, land values went up much faster than rental rates. We're moving into a period where I think they'll either move in tandem or rental rates might, be, might go up more than land values. Now, the thing that's holding land values up right now and will for the foreseeable future is that inflation. Like I said, land's a very good inflation hedge. We also have very strong non-farm investment demand, and, and farmers always say, man, I, I, you know, they're, they're driving up these prices. But I would agree with uh, uh, Sean Haney. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Sean Haney, that uh, when you see the real high bids, that's usually two farmers bidding against one another. The non-farm investors look at the fundamentals and will stop. They might write it up if they can get a good cash rent, depending on what their, what their cap rate is. They might write it up, but as soon as it, it gets beyond the, the, where the fundamentals are at, they're out. Uh, what are your thoughts on the ability for the new farmer purchased over the last five years to sustain a viable operation over the next five years? Uh, well, I think if you are, there's two things that way I would answer that. Uh, the net returns are going to be down. So hopefully uh, your leverage situation is, uh, is good meaning that debt to asset ratio is below 0.3, hopefully, and hopefully you have some working capital. Uh, I've been, uh, this, despite the fact that I talk about tax planning and I talk about how generous our depreciation rules are in the United States, we have 100% bonus depreciation right now. You can write off the entire asset. Section 179, which is another big write-off, is, is a million, $1.08 million write-off. Despite that, I always tell people, now hold on a second. You've got to think about, before you buy anything, what your working capital situation is like. You've got to have a cushion going into 23 and 24. Because there's going to be, the 20, the 23 might be better than I, th than I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be a tight margin year. Hopefully it's better than that. Uh, you $6 corn, we're looking at $6 corn next fall. Guess what the break-even price is? $6. $6 break-even. It was $4. Uh, you know, uh, Two years, two years ago. So it's, it's went up that much. And so we're in a tough situation there. Uh, uh, preserve working capital. Uh, how long before you think we could see interest rates come down? Oh, boy. <laughs> two, three years, and then they're not going back to where they were. So if they go up to 9 to 10, maybe they'll come back to 8. They're not going back to 4 or 5 anytime soon. So if that's where you think, uh, that's where that question is heading, 
They're not going to four or five anytime soon. Should, should uh, we be increasing our cash position to be able to purchase distressed assets? Yes. Instead of paying down debt previously locked? Yes. Yes yeah, is the answer to that question. This is an excellent question, and you definitely should be. Uh, preserving that working capital for opportunities rather than paying down debt. I know it's tempting to pay down debt. My father did it. He was one of those, like, you know, remember my grandfather, really nervous about debt. My, my father was a little bit less concerned. My brother is even a little less concerned. So generations were getting a little bit more reasonable or normal, if you will. It's hard to call Langmuir normal uh, under a lot of conditions, if you know us. Uh, but nevertheless, I, nevertheless, I, 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 you know, I, I, <coughs> <coughs> you need to preserve your working capital so you can take advantage of opportunities. And that's it. We're out of time for questions, which is probably good timing because I think Michael needs a drink. Oh, thank you. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks, Michael. That was an incredible presentation. So much information. I was taking pictures of all the slides just to dig through it all. Um, I think we could run an entire conference just on what was in your presentation alone, but um, thank you so much for coming all the way here, especially this close to American Thanksgiving. I enjoyed it. Um, very much appreciate it. And he's great. here with his wife enjoying the town, which yeah. is great. Great location, by the way. Uh, I'm going to the Commodity Classic next March, <coughs> and I'm not looking forward to going to Orlando. <laughs> not at all, eh? <laughs> I'm not a mouse person, uh, so I'm not looking forward to going to Orlando. Well, we definitely appreciate you here <laughs> and appreciate the support from AFSC and Kevin and his team um, for bringing you all the way here. So if you can put your hands together for Michael. <laughs>